Um, my name's Pete. Obviously, I work for, for the National Association for Sustainable Agriculture. It's one of the biggest certifying bodies in the country. Um, we were the, uh, the original certifying body. We opened our doors in 1986. And uh, since then, we've diverged into, um, into marketing, uh, promotion, and education, um, and uh, really supporting and developing um, programs that provide information not only to our existing operators but also the organic industry, um, wider, the wider community within the organic industry um, and come to these things and just providing information for people to take away and um, implement into their own systems, parts of it, all of it. Sometimes we have people that come, come to these sort of things on the day and say, hey, I've been looking at this for two years and I'm ready to jump on. Um, other people come on board and just adopt some some practices in organics and, and never actually become certified and that's fine as well. Um, it's ultimately about um, uh, the markets and which markets you as prime producers want to access and, um, and what, I, what I'm planning to do today is just run through um, obviously the organic industry and, um, and, and steps to certification. So just quickly through the, through the talk as I said, NASA, um, who we are. Um, now, if you need, uh, need any more information after today, um, you've obviously, um, you can come up and grab me. I've got plenty of cards on me and we can, um, we can follow on from today. Don't mind a good chat, as some of you already know. Um, and obviously, we're linked into Facebook and, and all the other things and the, and the websites. We'll cover the organic industry, what it is, the, uh, the emerging markets, where they are and, and how, we, how we are getting to where, we're, um, where we are at the moment. And then we'll run, to, through, um, run you through steps to certification, how it, how it does actually work. And we'll touch on what, what I mentioned on there and what Channel 9 carefully, carefully took all the words out of my mouth. Um, so Australian farmers historically um, have been innovators. Um, we invented the, the uh, stump jump plough, the sunshine harvester, um, and have, 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 have been continuously leaders in innovation and, and, and ingenuity. Um, and despite environmental and, and, and varying environmental and political climates, um, farmers have always been able to adapt and recognise opportunities when they popped up in emerging markets, wherever they may be. Um, and uh, the organic industry itself is, is, is now really coming out as, a, as the fastest growing sector within agribusiness. Um, and I'll touch a bit more on, on the exact figures in, in, in a minute. But... Um, there's certainly demand, not only, well, even, even today we've seen that the, the demand for organic um, produce um, certainly outstrips the supply. We heard Mike from Norco talk, the OMC talk, and they're just, uh, they're just um, some local guys. Um, I'm feeling phone calls from Woolworths, Coles, big processors in Victoria. Um, in particular, Bellamy's Organics, another one, um, and we're all sort of working together to build that organic supply. Um, but as you've also heard, um, you know, there's no easy road to it, but it it's certainly um, has different rewards that a lot of people draw out of it as they go along. So this from a prime production side is just a, uh, a definition that, that I've sort of tried to bring into um, a, 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 like a layman's term, something that everyone can sort of understand. Um, organic agriculture is the holistic management, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory as you can see, um, of an environmental system to produce food. Um, utilising natural ecological process biodiversity with consideration to animal welfare and social responsibility. So it's, it's essentially utilising the country that you've got, that you, that you own, um, and sustainably stocking it. So you actually decrease your incidence of worm burden and animal welfare issues um, and, um, and obviously social responsibility. And saying that, I just want to add that it's, it's not a matter of just owning a country and not looking after it. That's long gone, that, and, it's, and it's poor farming management. I come from a livestock background, and uh, if anyone told me that organic farming is simply just not doing anything to it, I'd, um, I'd get fairly upset. So key concepts to, um, to organic agriculture, it all starts with any farming system. It all starts with the soil. Um, healthy soil um, gives you healthy systems and ultimately healthy food. Um, in organic systems, when you look at something that's on top of the ground, it's giving you an indication of what's under the ground. So if a certain weed species growing, it's giving you an indication of what sort of soil is, what, what is the condition of the soil under that, under that plant. 
that's, that's allowing that plant to actually produce. So if you don't want that weed and it's not conducive to the pasture that you're trying to grow or the crop that you're trying to grow, then it's something that's happening from the soil. So I was just emphasising the point that everything comes back to the soil and, and particularly with organics, it's a very intimate process when you come in with your soil. So you get, you get down into the soils and you can work out your, 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 your root horizons your, and your microbiology and things like that and you'll find that good organic farmers really know what's happening under the ground. Supply chain transparency within organics. Um, this, this not only um, is extended to the certification process and the auditing process uh, in a way that, um, well, it happens in any farming system anyway. You know, you, you, purchase, you purchase an input, you know how much you, you paid for it, how much you bought and how much you're spreading out over your paddocks. Um, when the auditing process comes along, that's exactly what they're going to be asking you for, essentially. So it's, it's creating a transparent pathway from your production, how did you produce that food, the auditor comes on and you just present those, that paperwork. They say, so this is what I put in it, this is, this is where it's come from and this is where it's going. Um, you kept obviously NLIS tags, it gives you a, a tracking system anyway with your cattle if you're selling it to cattle, uh, if you're working with cattle. Um, and essentially, as, uh, you know, as, as, an, um, as a summary, that, uh, that is what the auditor is going to come on board and have a look at. So what's come into the farm, how's it grown and where's it sold. Supply chain transparency also extends into the, the broader supply chain, so downstream businesses. Um, I, I personally, coming from an agricultural background, I personally um, um, see the importance in transparency in the supply chain irregardless of, what, um, of your management practice. Um, so I do a lot of work with not only primary producers and coming and talking to primary producers, but I also encourage the presence of processes in the same room because half the battle is that networking that happens at these workshops. So NASA also sets up and runs workshops that, that provides that, that platform for, for producers to be able to meet the processes and vice versa. Um, so that once we get that transparency going in the broader supply chain, um, then the processes and the, and the producers can work a lot better. And once you've done that, the logistics takes care of itself largely. Have the conversation, challenge the status quo. So we all know I came from a conventional um, background. Um, we, we're brought up uh, and told um, a certain way that we produce food and, and the inputs that we use and how it's done. Uh, I used to get in a bit of strife because I used to ask too many questions. Um, and, um, and from that, I went and, and did further research uh, with natural resource management, sustainable agriculture, rotational grazing. Uh, if you're going to be backlining while you're putting them in the same paddock um, that you took them out of and leaving them in there, um, all, these, all these sort of things, breaking the worm cycle, that sort of stuff on a conventional system, I took it into an organic one. Um, and obviously market choices, this whole thing is, is driven by market choices um, and, uh, and ethical reasons behind it. So people come to me and they say, you know, I'm spending all this money on, on double strand superphosphates um, and, and over a period of time my yields are getting less, my soil is becoming acidified, uh, I want to do this. Um, um, and then you've got other people that are saying, um, okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing that uh, future trends are indicating to me that I need to go down this pathway and it's certainly, it's certainly the case. So the, the organic industry, as, as Bruce said this morning, it's a $1.8 billion industry and growing by 15 to 20, 15 to 20 percent each year. Um, demand is outstripping supply and we've seen a small, a small localised example of that. The demand is outstripping supply by over 40 percent um, and, and, and growing. Um, as, the, as various, um, various incidences within agriculture, such as succession planning and the ageing population of farmers and things like that, um, has an impact on conventional agriculture, we still experience the same things and, and probably more so in organics because we, we don't have the economies of scale that conventional guys do. So we lost 40% in one fell swoop of our, of our grain industry in one compulsory acquisition down in the Riverina. And uh, since then, Nobody really made it a concerted effort to chase that grain and now we're left with a situation where we've got quite a, quite a significant grain shortage in the organic industry. Now it's great if you're growing organic grain because you're getting upward of $600 per metric tonne X farm or $650 per, you know, per metric tonne X farm. No good if you're a dairy farmer or wanting to sort of jump into Norco and, and, and want to actually become certified and, and get that 50 to 60% premium that you're getting on your milk um, at the vat. And obviously shifting consumer demands um, we're seeing is driving that, that demand. Uh, and now with the incidence of, of China, 
Uh, we are uh, merely a, a shelf in the Chinese um, food market, Australia-wide. Um, an emerging 300 million emerging middle class with a significant disposable income. Um, the sheer numbers of that drives, drives a huge amount of consumption. And in fact, 5.4% of the Chinese economy is Australian agricultural, um, or as part of that is consumption, and 20% and of that is Australian ex agricultural exports that's being consumed for that. And this is growing. They're, they're estimating that the Chinese, so that population will plateau out by 2030. And from then you'll start seeing a bit of a shift. But up to that point, um, you're seeing a, a significant amount of, of not only interest in the clean green image of Australian agriculture itself, but at the upper echelons of that upper middle class, you're actually seeing, um, you're seeing uh, a significant amount of interest in the niche markets for certified organic products. So the restaurants and the, and the, and the high end supermarkets that people want to go to and, and be seen at and be purchasing and, and putting on their tables. Um, that's, that's where certified organic is actually having some interest and some, some inroads into China. Um, just a quick segue, we got um, um, our certification services not only, not only um, cover domestic operators, um, there's, two, there's two types of standards with the, with the domestic operators. There's the, the, sh the small farmer um, system, um, which means that you can, you can deliver your produce straight to the consumers and that's much cheaper. Uh, then you've got a standard certification um, opportunity which is of, that it gives you access to exports and, and, and wholesalers and things like that at a national scale. And then you can, you can value add, but I'll talk more about that, but you can value add um, into China and a bunch of other exports as well. So I touched on that a minute ago, emerging markets and their consumption. Um, we've seen since 2009, particularly 2012, that that... Um, the Chinese and the Indian economies are actually, and I, I, I didn't have a little flash map like the other two fellas, so I probably should have chased that down, it's a pretty good one. Um, but um, the 300 million emerging middle class that are coming out, over a thousand people per minute are moving from rural China into the cities and, 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 and are getting access to that, to that money. It's mind boggling for us to comprehend this, but Bellamy's exports, um, they, they were, they're certified organic baby food and their baby formula they were selling into the Australian market at $25 a kilo for a tin. Uh, in China, they're selling for $80 a kilo. And as Norco has, they've had a lot of counterfeit and a lot of, lot of troubles with people buying up 20 tins in Australia and or Hong Kong and taking them over to China um, to sell them because they're so valuable. Um, and just simply the, um, the birth rate of, of that 300 million middle, the emerging middle class and their tiger mums, as, as Mike touched on, um, is driving that. Um, and it's just, it's a no-brainer for any business that wants to get into China. And India's an up-and-coming, but, uh, um, you know, could watch that space. So steps to certification, um, as it was. Um, initially, it was a, a pre-certification year, which was a year... Um, that was um, deemed necessary by the Department of Agriculture. Um, and then two years of in-conversion, at the end of that um, second year of in-conversion, um, you gain your organic certification. Now essentially, this hasn't changed. It's still a 36-month period for people who have said, ha have applied, say, ha have said, uh, applied a disallowed input yesterday and put their application in today. It still will be a 36-month period to organic certification. But if you take into consideration the amount of time it takes to bring a heifer calf up to joining age, joining then calving, that three year period is actually, it's not that, it's not that long. Um, and, um, and you take that time to change, change or, or build on the knowledge that, that you have and, and create the networks and the relationships that are really critical when you're working in or, into, into an organic system. Um, as it is now, um, the, the leading industry body, OISC, took a, um, took, a, took a case to the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture agreed to drop that, voluntary, uh, that pre-certification year and replaced it with a voluntary year. So what, that free, that, what, what happened here with the pre-certification year, there was a cost associated with that and it was a compulsory year that ha everyone had to adhere to. Now we've got a voluntary year that doesn't have any cost associated to it 
So the, the costing's gone back the other way, the way it should be. When you're earning the premiums, when you're getting the premiums in organics, you're paying the most for your, for your membership, which is about $830 a year um, annual fee once you've gone through that, that process, once you're fully certified. Um, so we, now we've got a voluntary year, which it, it isn't, it doesn't cost you anything, it, it, apart from the application fee, obviously, because we've got to pay people to go through the paperwork, do the auditing. Um, but then the in-conversion years are the, are the same and you, and you end up with organic certification um, at that year. You can, you can sell and label your product within this, within this time frame. So you can label your, your product as in-conversion and sell it as in-conversion. Um, and there are uh, quite a number of companies that actually pay a premium for in-conversion. It, it is definitely not a watering down of the standards nor the process of certification. Now this whole, this whole program is being driven by demands of, of by the demands of the consumer. So the consumer who is buying organic produce and who wants that, they want to know that the integrity of that product is intact. They want to know that it's chem free. They want to know that it's humane choice. They want to know that it's grass fed. And this is the really interesting thing, and I've got to give it to them. Good marketing, but humane choice. When you buy certified organic, you are buying humane choice. You are buying free range. You are buying grass fed all those things that are separately marketed now, you buy one product, certified organic, and they cover all of those. It's, it's mandated in all the standards that they adhere to all those, those requirements. What it could be, this is what I touched on last night in the news. Um, so if you can demonstrate to the, to, to the certifiers that you've been managing your farm for a period of time in an organic matter that falls within the parameters of, of the standards, which are a, a fairly well common sense approach to, to organic farming anyway. So if you're using, if you have, if you've been using naturally derived input, inputs from a non-GMO derived base, then there's a fairly good chance that you could put your application for, forward um, for this. But subject to soil tests and application clearance and the, and the inspection, there is potential that you, the best case scenario is that you can move into in conversion in one year and be fully certified within the, within the second. So if you're buying, if you, if you for instance buy some country and it's an old derelict orchard or something like that and it hasn't had any inputs over a period of time and you can prove that and they do the soil test and they all come back clear, you potentially could put your application in, get an in-conversion straight up, sell your product in conversion in the first year at some premium and be fully certified within the second. That's the best case scenario and that's all because they've dropped that pre-certification year which was, uh, which was, which was quite a... We, we really pushed it because we could see that it was punishing, punishing people that have been managing their farms in, in an organic manner for an extended period of time. So your, your cumulative total needs to be 36 months to organic certification. But if you can show that you've been managing your farm organically prior to your application, that can be backdated, taken into consideration and be, and be included into, into, your, um, into your application. So here's a quick summary, 36 months of total organic management required. Identify the area to be certified, the whole farm or part of it. I'll go through this in a second, what I mean by that. Fill in your application, the soil test, the inspection will happen and then, you, then you'll either be approved um, to go into in conversion or the voluntary year or whatever. Um, or they'll, they'll ring you up and say, you're just missing something, we just need this we need that, something's just not clear or something's popped up or something like that. We've got an organic, we've got a, um, a certification support officer that will sit down and talk you through the process of your application, run through summaries, run through like anything that needs to be checked or approved, whatever else. And obviously I'm on the ground and I've always got my phone on me, so give me a yell. So alternative pathways to organic certification. Okay, so we've run through the organic industry, we've run through steps to the steps to, the, the steps to certification. <coughs> Now we run through um, a couple of different ways that you can, you can gain, gain organic certification um, at the same time. Parallel production is, is within our standards, it's determined as where land is progressively converted over a period of time. This works really well in a cropping sense and we're, we're, we're using it quite a bit in bringing a lot of cropping guys over, we're doing a lot of work trying to bring a lot more grain into the dairy industry um, and, and into the industry as a whole. Um, so parallel production where, you, where you've got a huge reliance on, on synthetic inputs to actually build that, get your crop up, drop some nitrogen on it, get the yields um, and, and run it off. To pull, them, pull those systems out 
or, and, and start, start an organic system would be quite, quite damaging to the business and it'd be really hard to actually do. So parallel production is basically a way that you bring country in to, to organic certification over a period of time. You've got 10 years to do it, which is three three-year cycles to do it. Um, and a lot of people use it as a bit of a running trial. So over four to five years, you're pulling, you've pulled your synthetic inputs out, you've managed the decrease in yields that are inevitable because you're not pumping, the, pumping those, those, um, those are high, high nitrogen, high phosphorus inputs into them. Um, and then over a period of time, you're running a system where you've got an organic system running around the outside, but you're still able to sell those, sell, you know, still manage your farm over here in a conventional manner. And over 10 years, you can bring around the whole farm under certification. And if you can't bring it in that time, you just need to provide us with a plan on how you manage to do it over 20 years or whatever. So it's quite a long time to, to, to change your, your management practice and get into your head how you're going to how you're going to adapt and you've got the networks, you've got the relationships, you've got your markets, you've got your markets with, you know, if you're dairy, Norco, OMC, um, whole grain milling, um, you know, heritage feeds out of uh, southwest Queensland, southeast Queensland. Um, you've got those contacts, you've got the transparency in the supply chain, you've got the support from the certifiers um, and, and you can bring it around. Um, in, in other systems, I, I sort of talk about, um, when you're talking about parallel production and the, and the new system that we've got underway in regards to dropping a preset. If you've got a marginal part of your country um, that you haven't been, and everyone's got, got that sort of, you know, that back paddock in, on their block where they haven't put their, so they, they haven't needed or didn't see it, you know, valid or valuable enough to actually put any superphosphates out on that part of the land or haven't had any synthetic inputs in there, Start looking at bringing that part of the farm in under parallel production. Look at that part of the farm and then bring your next part of the farm, next farm, next part. And if you've got a massive blackberry issue down on the flats or you've got some fireweed that you can't deal with, deal with them conventionally as you're bringing that other farm in. And it's a way of getting into the system, getting that leg up and into, into a system that's giving you, like slowly changing your system over a period of time. But it's not, it's not drawing out of something that you knew or grew up with and, and were taught how to do. Um, and come along to workshops and things and work out how you do all the other things as well. Um, leasehold is also a very, very valuable one. Being a young bloke, um, um, I can see a lot of fellas that would love to get into, love a lot of people that would love to get into, um, love to get into farming, um, but they don't have the capital outlay to do it. It's very expensive um, to buy, not only just buy the real estate, but buy the livestock now. You know, 16, 1,600 bucks for a cow and calf unit. Um, it's quite expensive to buy cattle now as well. So how do you actually get into farming in the first place? Or how do you get into organic farming? It's the same thing. Leasehold country is, is a way that you can, be, you can move into certified organics. Um, same again, if you, own an, if, you, if you own a dairy up the road and you want to leasehold this country down here, you can certify that country. You just have to, you have to show the certifier that you've got the management rights over that country to do it. Yeah, so we have some people that own a a conventional farm up here, a conventional orchard for instance, a good one, conventional orchard up there. And they've, they've got some margin, like a, a, an orchard down here. South Australia is a big one for this. There's a lot of abandoned orchards up in the Adelaide Hills. And there's people that are buying those, cleaning them up and certifying them yeah. under the new system because they haven't had any disallowed inputs in, into them over 15 years, whatever. So it's, it's easy for them to convert it. And then it's a way of their businesses diversifying into new markets that are emerging, not only domestically, but also, also across the world as well. So that's, that might be a good way of looking at it as well. So if you're a conventional beefing oper uh, beef or dairy operation and you want to diversify into a new one, have a look, have a look at possibly certifying another part, of country, another part, another parcel of land somewhere else that hasn't, has, has been abandoned or whatever else over a period of time. But leasehold can be done. The conversion to organics and, and organic management, um, it's a tricky one. Uh, it is hard work, um, but there is help along the way. Um, I run a lot of workshops. I collaborate with a lot of people that run workshops and build information. So between um, the certification support officer, um, me, uh, I do a lot of traveling, I do a lot of talking, um, and I really enjoy networking. Um, and I love, uh, I love it when people come up to me and say, hey, I'm doing this, do you know somebody that knows this, you know? And I'm still learning them. But you know, the more people talk, um, the, the more access 
to those to those support networks that we can that we can give to them.